This is the Sensitive Rebel Podcast, and I'm your host, Steve McCready. Join me for conversations with fellow sensitive rebels as we discuss the challenges of making a difference in a world that touches us deeply. If you're ready to turn your sensitivity into a secret weapon, then you're in the right place. Let's do this. Hey, Sensitive Rebel. For today's conversation, we're headed back to Canada. And my guest is Kim Chernecki, CEO and founder of Freedom Street. Kim is Canada's leading expert on helping high-performing freelance executives, consultants, coaches, and other experts land lucrative corporate contracts. She's the creator of the Land Corporate Contracts Fast Track System and is a top-rated sales performance executive, facilitator, coach, advisor, speaker, and strategist. Now, as you listen to Kim's journey, you're going to hear a lot of great tips and tools for dealing with the inevitable challenges and stresses that come with building and running a business. I especially like her processes for journaling, which I think are something we could all benefit from adopting. So let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Kim. Today on the Sensitive Rebel Podcast, I am talking with Kim Chernecki, who's coming to us all the way from Toronto, Ontario. How's it going, Kim? I'm great. How are you, Steve? I'm doing good. Thanks for for coming on the show. It's good to have a chance to talk to you. And so tell me, Kim, what are you rebelling against? Well, I don't know if this is politically correct, but working for the man, (laughs) if you will. Politically correct or not, we'll go with it because I think everyone understands exactly what you are saying. And I think that's absolutely uh, a common theme for a lot of the folks that I've had on the show and a lot of the folks listening to the show. But tell me more about what you mean by that. And where does that come from for you? You know, it's funny. Um, early on, I was always searching for what's my purpose? What am I meant to be doing in the world? And I worked for the man. I worked for organizations in corporate uh, Canada and was always working for someone else's vision and agenda. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but essentially what I'm rebelling against is depending on an organization to make income and to make sometimes selling your soul a bit or a lot. And I really came to realize at a fairly early age that I I am a visionary and I really rebelled against working for someone else's vision and agenda. And then fast forward a while, I work with clients around tapping into their purpose and turning it into their own business. And I met and have worked with hundreds of clients that put their heart and soul into an organization, some of them for like 20 plus years, and then lose their role from something completely beyond their control, like restructuring, downsizing, acquisition. I mean, there were people who literally went into fetal position because it's their, their, their world was gone. I really just, I guess my why is helping to support people to tap into their purpose and turn it into their own business so they don't have to work for their man. And what I'm hearing is you see the cost benefit analysis as it relates to working for the man doesn't seem like that particularly works really well in your assessments. You have this work that often can, I I tend to use the phrase, be soul sucking. (laughs) And what do you get for it? You get not even security, not even safety, because you might be at a moment's notice, just who knows what what can happen. And that might've been different in the past, but certainly doesn't seem to be true today. Well, it's interesting you say that because you just reminded me of something. So my parents both worked for organizations their entire career, the same organization for their entire career. And they said at a young age, Kim, you should get a job that has benefits and that has retirement. And, and I, at an early age, just intuitively rebelled against that. I don't know why, but certainly today, that's just not available. There just isn't that security. There isn't, I mean, benefits, sure, there's some, but uh, that retirement, you've got to create your own destiny, right? Gone are those days. So now, does that mean that working for an organization is bad? Certainly not, but I just know it wasn't good for me. I think from an early age, I knew I was an entrepreneur at heart. And my last full-time role, even though it was entrepreneurial and I was making great money, I just couldn't work for someone else another day. So I guess that's just my calling, my purpose. I'm interested in talking about that a little bit, the experience for you of working for others. Very clearly, as you're you know, looking back, you're like, okay, this didn't work for me. But what was that experience like? And what would you say, looking back, were maybe the clues or signs that you uh, either didn't notice or that eventually came to notice that this isn't working for me here? Yeah, 
Yeah, no, it's interesting as you ask that question because I had lots of great mentors in corporate. And now I have to say that most of the work that I did was with smaller organizations, not with big ones, right? So there was a kind of entrepreneurialness in it. And what worked is I had some fabulous mentors. But what didn't work for me is, and I guess I always had a head for strategy or for a vision, even though I didn't know what that was at the time, I just resented or just couldn't quite get why they were doing certain things. And I was asked to do certain things and I had to do them, even though intuitively, you know, I was screaming, no, and that's that soul sucking part that you're, that you were talking about. Um, and I just, it, there was just this, what's the word? There was not the boredom, but more the, just this restlessness that it just wasn't right. Just intuitively, it didn't feel right. I ended up leaving and I did a number of startups for others and which I thought might solve all that, but it was still someone else's vision. And it wasn't until I guess it was about 22 years ago, when I had my own startup with my vision that I really got, okay, this is what I'm meant to be doing. And let me tell you, it's not easy starting up a business, but um, I just knew I, I had to do it. It was something inside calling me. The way things have unfolded is I am now doing what I'm meant to be doing. But back then, it was just this intuitive sense of, get me out of here. I can't do this any longer. What are the things that you can remember either like going through your work days or at the end of the day, the thoughts or feelings that you had that were, again, signs that this is not the right fit for you? Out of here. I want out of here. I don't want to do these tasks. I would just want to to just just to leave and put it all behind me. I wanted to cut corners. There was just this feeling of I just want to get out of here. I want to be done. I don't believe in what I'm doing. I just somehow I'm compromising myself. And it yeah, it was just this um, overall sense of restlessness. And I eventually came to realize that I wasn't tapping into my sweet spot. Like I wasn't living my strength, you know, what I'm great at. And, and I remember I, I actually took this, I mean, diverting a little bit, but I took this assessment called uh, Strengths Finder. And this is going back a long time ago. And it just showed me what my top five strengths were. And I went, oh my God, no wonder. One was being strategic, futurist, inclusiveness, empathy, which comes to the sensitivity part, like all these things that was going against the grain. That's what it is. It's going against the grain of what I was doing working for someone else and what I was doing working in terms of working for someone else. I wasn't really playing into my strengths. And I'm hearing one, just the sense of it, just feeling like this constant grind. Although anyone who's had their own business knows there are times and spaces where it feels like that too. Absolutely. But it's different. <laughs> right. Well, it's different. And I think the difference, but you tell me your thoughts on this. What I think I'm hearing is for you, the difference was there, it had this sense of pointlessness or purposelessness. It wasn't going towards something that mattered to you, that resonated to you, that aligned with you. It was like, yeah. And I knew I was developing skills and experience and business acumen. And, and, and by the way, I love the business world. I love the corporate landscape. And I actually work with people to be able to provide services to that, but to them, not within them. And, and I, I really got that I was developing skills and I was developing experience that was going to serve me well, but it was this constant going against the grain, like that grind, like you're, you're talking about. And it was also for the money. And I didn't want to be selling my soul for money. And you're right. It, in your own business, it, it can be challenging. In fact, it's probably harder than you thought it would be. No, probably about it, I would say, Kim. <laughs> yeah, there's no right, you're right. Let's take that. Yeah, there is no probably about it. You're absolutely right. But there's a sense of, you know, it's interesting. One of my clients said to me, it's the hardest thing I've ever done working for myself, but also the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And I would never go back to corporate. That's kind of, that's singing my song. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And that is the the key thing I think is that those moments of where you're really engaged in the work and it's really aligned with your purpose and really feels like you're doing something that matters. Those moments, which those of us who have had them know them. It's one of those yeah. things that's hard to describe, but if you felt it, you know it, that you don't have if you were in some job working for someone else that's not aligned with you. That's really the key. Those things are so powerful and energizing, at least in my experience. And that's, I think, what we're talking about. Completely agree. And being having your own business is certainly not for everyone. And certainly there's a lot involved in it. But I know for me, it, it couldn't be 
otherwise. I just couldn't work another day for someone else. I just couldn't do it. Yeah, my soul was being sucked. I couldn't do it. Tell me about the the process of getting to the this a breaking point if there was one. Like, how did you go from okay, I'm I'm doing this and I'm grinding along in this thing to like I can't do this anymore. I've got to go do something else. Tell me about that piece of your journey. There's a long journey there, and I won't go into all the details. But suffice it to say, I had done a number of startups for others. I had done my own business and my own first business, a little kind of similar, but first iteration of what I'm doing now. And then I had a business, I took on a business partner and the, uh, make a long story short, the, the business partner, three weeks before we were going to relaunch and we'd done all this investment into doing an online platform and blah, blah, blah. He bailed on me. So I had to shut the business down and go back to a job. And that was one of the most dark nights of the soul moments in my life. But it was one of the best things that could have ever happened because this company that I went to work with really set me up in a whole better way to what I'm doing now. I just want to ask a little bit about this, the dark night of the soul, as you as you said, how did you talk yourself through that? Because I think, again, anyone who's done their own business or been really through life has had those moments. How did you get yourself through that? And keep going forward because it sounds like it did turn out to be a great launching pad. First of all, I had a total meltdown <laughs> for a few days. I, I actually had to uh, move back into my parents' place for a while. Now they were down in Florida, so I had the place to myself. But yeah, I just had a bit of a, an emotional meltdown and went into depression and all that. But then I have a very strong um, belief in the universe and, and in the grand order of things. And so a lot of talking to the universe, a lot of yelling at the universe, a lot of <laughs> asking for clarity, right? And it has been my experience that all challenges, all dark nights of the soul like that, that it made me an absolute expert <laughs> what I'm doing now because I support people who go through the same thing. And I can honestly say I've been there. And I think intuitively I knew that I was going through it so that I could relate. To answer your question, how, how I navigated that, yeah, a lot of talking to the universe, talking to some, you know, really great confidants, and then just pulling up my bootstraps. I was, you know, single at the time, so I had no one else to fall back on. And, and I had to make it work financially. And my parents didn't have the resources to help me through, so I had to go back, pull up my bootstraps, if that's still a term, and go back and get a job. So I did. And it did turn out to be one of the best things that could have ever happened to me because it took me to a whole different level in, in my sales effectiveness journey, my learning and development journey, and, and financially. I mean, I did extremely well at this new company that allowed me to then, nine years ago, go out on my own and do what I'm doing now. And, and it's funny because I can look back and, and when I go through those tough times now, I'm just like, here it is in one sentence. This is happening for me, not to me. That's a huge differentiation. How do you make that pivot for yourself? I've had several coaches and mentors, and I've worked with, you know, some psychotherapists in the past. And it was this one woman I was working with. It was like a feather touch. Like she said that to me, Kim, this is happening for you, not to you. And I was like, wow. And that was the one insight I got from my work with her was that concept. And I really, just out of experience, having gone through luck and pushed through lots of challenges, and I don't shy from them because if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you need to welcome those challenges. That has got me through. And it took a while to get there, but I just know it to be true now. I just know that if you want to develop as a person, develop as a business, that you're going to go through these challenges. And um, that is one of the biggest insights I can share, I would say. It's a huge shift, I think. And as you took this job that turned into this launching pad, where in that process of either taking or working that job did that awareness that this is happening for me come into being for you? And, and how did it go from the, okay, I'm taking this job as kind of retrenching to I'm going to use this as a starting point to go to bigger and better things? How did that happen for you? That's a great question. So I intuitively knew this was the right organization for me to work with. I was talking to a number of different organizations and it just was lining up. I just, it goes back to that intuitiveness. Like up here, what do you know? Like us logically, who are we to know what the right decisions are? But I think your connection with intuition 
is the, the only thing you can rely on. And intuitively, I just knew it was the right thing. And for six years, that organization, even though I knew I would go back out on my own, it really, it just really served me, like in, in every sense of the word. And so I knew that was happening for me. But there was always that restlessness, always that piece that I described earlier that was always there underneath the surface. But, you know, I knew it wasn't time, just knew it wasn't time. And then I guess it was in the year, seventh year, a, a woman came to work uh, with me and she just didn't like working with the organization. And it was like she just mirrored for me. It was now time for me to start moving on. So it just unfolded and I just, my restlessness went like this. And then I just went, you know what? I'm leaving. I like liken it to following the breadcrumbs. It's like little signs, little things. It's like tapping into your intuition, following the breadcrumbs of guidance that comes your way. And I think coming to depend on that as painful as it can be is what's really gotten me through my very, what number of people would consider tumultuous journey. And I hear that very much that for you tuning into and listening to your intuition and you know seeing the breadcrumbs as you were just describing is really important as part of your process one of the things i'm wondering about is how you you know stay connected to or reconnect to that in our world where literally everywhere you turn there are people telling you what you should do what you shouldn't do how you should do it how you shouldn't do it and all of that stuff there's so much noise that can easily just flood us and block out almost the intuition or the inner voices. So how do you stay connected to that inner voice of yours that is seemingly such an important part of your path, of your process? So I have a number of rituals I do, connecting with nature, going for walks in nature, my affirmations, I journal. And there's some people that I follow who I get really great insights from. But I think ultimately it's what feels right. Always connecting with what feels right. When I feel joy and I feel good, I know I'm following the right path. When I feel disconnected, because I really believe that your thoughts are things and your thoughts and, and your feelings are your guidance system. So when I'm feeling good and connected, I know I'm on track. When I'm not, I know I'm being pulled away or I'm not thinking properly or what someone's saying to me out there isn't the truth for me. So I've really honed my own internal guidance, if you will, around how I feel and what I think. I might sound a little woo-woo, but it's worked for me most of my life. I think that's super important. Like you just, one of the things you said, your feelings are your guidance system. I love that. So many people have such a hostile relationship with their feelings and they don't understand exactly what you just said. And I think that's such a fundamental truth and such an important one. So it sounds like you got that sorted out and that's part of what helped you. So to connect back to your, your journey here, you have this restlessness building in this company and realize, okay, it's time to move on from this. And so at that point, deciding to go do your own thing again, I could imagine that might have been scary since it hadn't worked out so well last time. But tell me about what the the thoughts and feelings were as you prepared to step into this this new chapter in your professional life and how you went about doing it. I was really excited. I thought it was, you know, it was time. I had just bought a, you know, really great investment property. So I knew that I would have some of that passive income supporting me. I was scared, but I just knew it was the right time. And having said all that, I went through a year of mistakes that I now share with my clients to not make those same mistakes. I have to say I probably wasn't as well prepared as I could have been. I tend to take more risks than probably most people, but I just knew I couldn't stay anymore. So I, I was less prepared than I probably should have been, but it was great learnings that I bring to my current clients around if you're going to leave corporate or if you're going to transition, you want to have a financial plan. I really didn't. I just knew I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> so don't do what I did. I don't know. <laughs> I think the financial preparation piece is, is a really important one because obviously there's so many pressures that can come with that. I, I will say though that I think it's important to be prepared for things. And at the same time, 
there are certain things that we can only be so prepared for. And, and, and part of getting ready for the thing is doing the thing. And I don't think there's any way to really prepare for having your own business past a certain point. You can understand the dynamics of it. You can study what other people have done and all of that. But there's a piece of it that is just about you have to go do it. You do. But I think, yes, preparing yourself and setting yourself up to minimize the pressures and challenges of it, including the financial piece, is good. Tell us about the, the early days and evolution of your business and your work. Yeah. So I, I basically work with small business owners as well as, you know, executives transitioning out, uh, out of corporate who want to define, structure, launch and grow their dream consulting or coaching or service based business, selling their services back to corporate. So when I first started out, I'd spent so much time doing business development. I thought, I just don't want to do that anymore. So I really worked with people around their business planning, getting aligned with what their you know, business could be and so forth. So I did that for the first year or two. I started by building and offering an online program and uh, it just didn't work. I mean, I realized I had to get some steady clients. So I ended up by year two getting very clear that I can teach people to do what I did best, which is how to do business development, selling back into corporate. Once I really got in touch with that and got past the resistance of doing that selling, if you will, my business just took off. So like year three, my business totally took off. And I have a whole methodology about helping people to define, launch and grow their business and to be able to sell or be trusted advisors back into corporate. But the first couple of years was really just about people in transition, helping them to get clear. And it just wasn't making the money it needed to make for me to you know, even break even. So that's what really helped to shift my business into doing the work that I did now. But the first couple of years was tough. But once I really got clear on, on what I'm doing now, and I developed my own methodology, became a thought leader, really got out there, then everything just took off for me. And during this first couple of years, while you're trying to sort this out and it's a little difficult and, and bumpy, how did you find the, I'll say the strength or the persistence to keep going and keep pushing with it, even though it was a little bit bumpy and messy at first? It was really tapping into really key supporters in my network. There, there happened to be a woman who was going through something similar to me. So she and I were like, you know, real confidants. It was really reaching out to key friends who had started their own businesses and having them as a support system. It was really tapping into my inner guidance again. It was doing a lot of journaling. It was networking and getting advice from people. So it was just getting really clear, following my guidance, following what is my sweet spot. All of a sudden, people are like, we've been looking for someone like you for like years. And then I landed this corporate contract at you know one of the biggest global human capital firms. And I said, can we don't know anyone who's doing what you're doing? We've been looking for someone like you for years. So it's almost like all the stuff that I had been intuitively knowing I should do all of a sudden it just came together. I, I don't know if that, that makes sense. It, would, it makes sense from the standpoint of that. It does seem to be how this process often works. We're grinding away at it and trying to sort it out and trying to filter through. And at some point it connects or it gets clear enough that it's visible to others. And then they're like, Oh, Oh, here's this thing that I've been, you know, wanting or needing. It's it, suddenly that it's there. So it, it actually does make sense yourself because through the whole thing, I've always been following the breadcrumbs, being true to myself and helping others to do the same. And it, I just knew all of a sudden everything just came together. I'm hearing how much for you, the work on journaling support system, right? All of these pieces of surrounding yourself with these reinforcing things to help you stay connected to that were important. The, the biggest question that comes up for me and probably for other people who are in the midst of early phases of a business is, how the heck did you find time to do that too? <laughs> All the day-to-day -day stuff. Like how did you create space for that? Because it is crucially important, I think, but because it's not necessarily so urgent, it's a spot where I think a lot of people, they just, they don't necessarily do, even though it might be absolutely what's crucial to be able to, to keep going and, and get things working. It's critical that you take the time to get connected, to get clear, because it is my absolute profound belief that acting on inspired guidance where you get those breadcrumbs, where, where things happen, you just know it's the right path, 
is a thousand times more productive than just busy work. So I basically act on my guidance every day. And, you know, all those like busy tasks that you think you should be doing, that's your little logical mind when you can tap into the bigger universe who's going to bring you the guidance. It's the biggest time saver I know (laughs) in the long run. So to me, taking time, doing what you feel inspired to do and what you've been guided to do is infinitely more productive than doing that busy work. And I think that's probably the key piece is getting the awareness that, oh, even though this feels like I don't have time for this, the reality is that it is an investment that has a tremendous payoff that's much greater than other things you might be doing with that time. It's it, absolutely, you know, it's interesting because I work with people on strategy and tactics to create a six to seven figure business all into corporate. And what I'll also say to them is, you know what? It, at the end of the day, all those strategies and tactics will mean nothing if you're not connected to your source, if you're not connected to to your guidance, because that's where you really get all the, the meaningful answers, right? Those other things are important, but it, the being, it, it might sound woo, but being connected to that source, to the universe, to that guidance is, it, it's 90% of, of what you should be doing. I think it's one of those things that, because it's hard to quantify, people label it in different ways, but also it can then be a thing we start to to talk about it as woo-woo or whatever. But yeah, yeah, so yeah. many people that I've talked to have talked about that that idea that I have when I learn to tune inward and listen, listen for the quiet voices, that's when I really got the key insights and was really able to make some powerful things happen. So I I think we have to actually be really careful about this because it can be easy to dismiss it uh, because it's hard to quantify in this hard scientific way. But that doesn't mean there's not data to support the import of that if you just look at the stories of different people, right? 100%. And in fact, the more you rely on that quiet place and those voices and or whatever you want to call them, the more they show up for you, the more you attract them, the more things, all the best things that have happened to me have just arrived. All the how just shows up and arrives. When I've really planned something and worked at it, yeah, I'll have some success, but I feel exhausted after. And it's really the things that were really mine just showed up effortlessly. Tell me about, you said, you know, over the first couple of years of sorting things out, you've developed a methodology for, you know, what you do and how you work with people. And I would imagine this is a a piece of that, but I'd like to understand that a little bit more. Give us a little bit of an idea of the work that you do with your clients and what that looks and feels like. Sure. And, you know, it's interesting because my methodology is actually quite, well, strategic and tactical. It's not the woo-woo component at all, but I weave in the woo-woo component by by the work that I do and the compassion and and, and everything else. Because because I'd say 80% of who I work with are corporate executives who are leaving corporate. And so you got to watch the language in and how you, you if I, so I have a methodology. It's called the land corporate contracts fast track system. And it's the, all the steps to identify source, engage with and close corporate contracts as a trusted advisor. That's elegant. So that's the, the bucket, the container. But in doing that, I work with people on their mindset, on their visualize, you know, having their goals, what's their why, what's the vision and all that. So I do all that, but I do it in the container of the land corporate contracts, fast track system, if you will. I think that's aligned with how a lot of the world and the business world works, right? They're looking for a lot of those things. And so we have to package it in a certain way, but that doesn't mean that we can't contain other things inside. So yeah, maybe it's a little, little sneaky, little Trojan horse ask, but at the end of the day, exactly, you got it. Trojan horse-esque. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that's true. And you know, you hear that in marketing sometimes, right? You sell people what they want, but you give them what they need. <laughs> you, know, you got it. You absolutely got it. Because I don't, I don't, in any of my marketing and the way I talk, I like to think I don't come across as woo or the language with credibility, if you will. And oh yeah, it's all it's all in there. But, but you're right, and I give them what they need. 
that makes a lot of sense to me. And that's um, part of, I think, the job of those of us who are supporting others is also being able to do some translation. They don't always know how to articulate what's going on for them or what they're looking for. They just know what they feel or they're then putting it in the framing of what they hear, the words and things they hear out in the world. And I think sometimes our job as people who have awareness and insight and knowledge here is to be able to connect those dots for them in various ways. And marketing what we do is just one way that shows up, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So what would you say have been some of the challenges that you've had in more more recent times as you've gotten your business established and stable? The, the challenges that you have, have they changed over time? Are they the same? Or how's that evolved? What's interesting, it especially in having your own business, you have to stay current. And I think about a great example of that is what we've just been navigating the pandemic, right? March, 2020, everything came to a halt for a good couple of months in terms of corporate needs that my clients are serving. Corporate needs went out the window. Strategies got thrown out the window. Business models got thrown out the window. It was incredible. What we were navigating is everyone had to just go virtual and stay home and supply chains were disrupted and all that. So what I did was, for example, I pivoted my business. You're not supposed to use that word anymore because it's so entirely overused, but to help small business owners to re-engineer their businesses to the new corporate needs. So the corporate marketplace is so complex now, and there's so many complexities that are being navigated and corporate needs help navigating those complexities. So there's never been a better time to be a consultant or small business owner who sell their services to corporate. I help people to make that adaptation. So I took what was a big challenge because my sales funnel just came to a complete stop for a couple of months. Then it just picked way back up again because I adapted and stepped up to the challenge, helping other people to step up to the challenge. So that has just unleashed a whole bunch of different challenges, the pandemic, right? Because we're the whole world was thrown into something completely new and unexpected. So that's, I guess, one big thing that happened in terms of navigating challenges. And I'm also starting off a, an AI company. I've been doing that around my land corporate contracts methodology. It's like an AI sales technology tool that I'm starting up. There's been challenges getting that started up because of the pandemic and some other things. So there's always going to be challenges that you have to navigate. And as a small business owner, as someone in life, you resolve one challenge just to go to another level and have a bigger challenge. We're always going to have challenges. I think there's a lot of people who get caught up in the idea that if I just get everything sorted out enough or dialed in enough, then there won't be challenges anymore. (laughs) (laughs) But it sounds like you recognize that's not true. That's not true. It's just simply not true. Because I think life is meant to be challenges and that's what helps us grow. I don't love it. I wish that it could just be coasting, but I just, that isn't my experience. When a new challenge arises for you or or with challenges in general, what is the, the mental framing you put on them that helps you to face them in a more productive and effective way than others might? So first of all, journaling, and I'm talking, letting it rip, like just complete free flow until I can't write anymore. And a lot of it is blaming the universe what are you doing to me? Even though I know you're doing it for me, doesn't feel like it right now. Right? And so first of all, I just let everything out. Like, and then I let just everything out in journaling. And I'm, t- I'm talking absolutely unedited journaling or walking and praying, whatever you want to call it, doing the same thing. So to me, so it gets it all out. Then usually I'll feel better after. And it's like, oh, this is happening for me, not to me. So I get grounded in that. And then I discovered this process that to me is just brilliant and it's called ask and you will receive. What that means is, besides the biblical term, is asking a whole bunch of questions and writing them out. Just asking, so why is this happening? Am I taking right action? And I just ask as many questions as I possibly can of my brain, universe, God, whatever you want to call it, until I'm complete. I'll write like 50 questions out asking in every single way, should I do this? And should I continue the relationship with this person? I'll ask question after question. And once I've got it all done, I just leave it. And I know the answers are going to come. So how do you come up with the questions? Free flow. Free flow brainstorming thing. 
free folder and streaming thing. Like, for example, when we went into the pandemic, oh my God, what does this mean for myself and my business? What does this mean for my clients? What should I do? Should I develop a webinar? If I develop a webinar to get out there, what should I say? What should I, like, I ask all these absolutely ridiculously silly questions. And then I'll start asking powerful questions. What's a powerful way for me to respond to this? What is the best action for me to take? So I'll just ask and ask until it's almost like journaling, but in a, in a way that I don't have to come up with the answers. The answers will be shown to me because I've asked the question. I hear that it's a very similar process and that it's really just unloading what's going on in your brain. And just knowing that your brain, the universe or whatever, will always answer your questions. We don't know the answers, but we could, we know the questions. And the source, intelligence, universe, whatever you want to call it, has the answers and will provide those answers at the right time. Not always immediately, but at the right time. And I hear how much you really trust that. Is that something that comes from your historical experiences with it? Yeah, it is. And, and just having it proven time and time again. And I am one of the most impatient people you, you've ever met. Like I want answers right away. I mean, that's why I'm probably pretty good at, you know, business development because I've got a sense of urgency, but I do trust that the answers will, will come the right action will come, the inspiration, the event, the circumstance will happen at the right time, if I ask. How do you give yourself permission to do this, I'll call it very raw journaling that you do, which I think is great, and I completely agree with you. I find a lot of people struggle with it, right? They have these voices that come up about how they should be doing it, or is this doing it right, or any number of other things. How did you get to where you're able to really do it in that just raw, unfiltered way? And while you're doing it, do you have uh, like an editor voice that pops up in your head ever or anything? So funny, yes, that's, that's interesting. I do it because it feels good and it works. And I, it's that emotional guidance system. Again, I just need to, rather than holding everything in, it gets it out there. And then it's kind of like, okay, I got it out there. And then all of a sudden that quiet, positive voice will just come because I know that limiting negative constricted voice doesn't serve me. It's time tested and true. I just know if I go out there and I'm able to just let it rip, I just feel better by getting it out. And I just know especially in asking those questions, the answers will come because of historical experience, because I've done it for so many years. It doesn't mean those those negative voices don't come up. They do. The ego, whatever it is, still comes up. But if I just let it have its voice, I just give it space to express itself, it'll calm down. I'm yeah. hearing so much how tuning into what's worked for you, past successes, really helps you to continue to engage in these processes. I'm wondering early on how it was that you got yourself to, to do these things or how you got to that point. Like if we had someone, like if you had a, a, maybe a client or say you were like, hey, you should do some journaling and they're, they're struggling with this. What would be the advice or guidance you'd give to them to help them push through whatever their kind of negative self-talk around it might be? To try it. So I will share these processes with all my clients and they're like, for the most part, oh, Kim, this is brilliant. I love this. There's some that just aren't ready to do it and I don't feel right doing it. I've had people come back and said, wow, you really planted a seed that I've started to use because I, I experienced, you know, negativity, depression that from a very early age, I had to find these processes to help me because it was just part of who I was. So I had to find them. I think what you said, the idea of just try it is really important because part of that's giving ourselves permission to have it be whatever it is. Like just try it. Did take 15 minutes, take five minutes, whatever big deal. It's five minutes. It's 10 minutes. It's a little bit of, of time investment. And when you can get someone to the point of do an experiment, that'll allow them to get an outcome. And as soon as they start to see, Oh, this produces something, then you've got that reinforcement loop going. Yeah. I mean, it, because I mean, it's not for everyone. So it, it's just try it. And if it works for you, then great. With the, the time that we've got left here, I want to talk a little bit about where you see yourself and your business going from here as you continue the, the fight against the man. What's next for you and what do you see as both the possibilities and maybe the, the challenges on that path? So it's interesting. I, I talk about my rebelling against the man, but meanwhile, I'm all about providing services to the man 
right? From the outside, from your sweet spot, um, in which there's so much opportunity because organizations want and need external help versus full-time employment. We're in the gig economy. That's just the reality. And it's wonderful for everyone concerned because everyone gets to, you know, live their passion and be able to have a, lots of business out there. So I love it. But what's coming next for me, actually, is besides the work that I'm doing with Freedom Street, which is the name of you know, my business, is building this AI company. And what this AI company is, it's called Rainmaker. And it's taking, basically, it's going to be a game changer for helping people prospect and develop business into corporate. So that's really where I'm heading now. I'm still doing my work, my group coaching programs, which are going really well, but it's starting up Rainmaker. So I'm starting it up now as of this month and uh, looking to have the tool ready for beta testing around November, December, and then taking this huge. So adding so much value to help people be able to get in front. It really is to help people get in front of the right executive decision makers with their, with what they do. So that's what's next for me. Anything you can at this point share with us about it, how it works, how it's going to help connect. Cause that, one of the things I'm hearing is the big difference here is it's about connecting you to the right prospects, right? It's like, cause there's the, I can go knock on every door, but that's not very efficient. And if you knock on the right doors, you can save a heck of a lot of time and energy, but it's figuring out what the right doors are. So what this, essentially what this tool will do is think about LinkedIn sales navigator, think LinkedIn sales navigator on steroids. So basically it's helping you, you fill out, you get very clear on your sweet spot. You're going to get a hot list of ideal target corporate clients. You're going to get a hot list every day along with all the contact information. And you will get a, and this is where the AI comes in, you're going to get a intelligent, customized, relevant, pre-populated email that you will be able to send to those decision makers to be able to get those meetings. So that's what the real secret sauce is. So it'll be all in one step, tweak the email a little bit, but it will help you to connect in a real, relevant, customized way. So the whole idea is you will get meetings with the right decision makers in the most powerful way possible, an intelligent, insight-driven way possible. That uh, could really be a game changer for a lot of people, I would think. Game changer. That's what this is meant to be. And um, what I'm doing is developing a rock star brand around it. So in terms of challenges, it's just, I've never built a technology company before. I'm not even technical. (laughs) But I'm not the tech geek doing this. I've got the people to do it. I've got all the advisors to help me to make it happen. So... I'm really excited. And th- this is one of the things that really feels meant to be because all of the connections, everything is just flowed to bring me to this point to be able to do this. So it just feels like everything's coming together to make this happen. So I'm sure there's going to be challenges, but just in just being scared because I'm wanting to build a like a 10 plus million dollar company. It's really exciting. Really excited. So for that, is there any place like online or any kind of a a list that people can get on who are interested in knowing more about it or seeing it coming? Or is it not quite to that point yet? It's not quite to that point yet. But if people would love to maybe have a conversation with me around getting corporate clients, they could could go visit my um, website, which is, you know, freedomstreetinc.com. Reach out to me and sign up and we'll have a conversation. I would just love that. That would probably be the best place to to guide people right now. Now, as you're going forward and now adding this this second thing, how are you managing or planning to manage the challenge of uh, spinning a couple of plates here simultaneously? Because that can be pretty tricky. I'm used to that. It's interesting being the sensitive rebel <laughs> that I am. I don't like to disappoint people. So I, I really have my house in order. I keep things really organized. So things don't fall through the cracks. Uh, I'm pretty good time manager, even though I'm not that detail oriented. I'm pretty good time manager. So, and, and the two kind of dovetail nicely too, because I'm all about helping people get those corporate clients. This tool is just going to make, is going to take the drudgery and research and all that out of it. So the two will dovetail quite nicely, actually. So it, even though it's a new thing, it really aligns in a way that there's a lot of a lot of similarity there. So it's two things, at least that's on a, a very parallel, closely aligned path. Absolutely. Because I'm all about helping people to add value and be a trusted advisor to t- executive decision makers. And this just helps you get into those doors more quickly and uh, without having to do all of the research and 
leg work and grunt work and all that, that we have to do <laughs> and knock on the wrong doors, knock on the right doors powerfully. It just fast, fast tracks everything, that's all. It's really going to be a nice dovetail, if you will. So a little bit of a, of a tangential question, but it came up in my mind because you were talking about, I don't like to disappoint people. So how do you deal with that though? Because one of the things that is essential if we're going to be successful in business or any endeavor is we need to learn how to say no. We need to learn how to have boundaries. We need to learn how to set limits. And yes, inevitably, that means somebody's going to be disappointed. So what are the ways you figured out how to handle that challenge and to be comfortable and confident and saying, no, sorry, I'm not going to be able to do that or you know, setting those limits? Oh boy. I'll tell you right now, Steve, that's an ongoing challenge for me because I guess one of my things is I like to add value. I want to be viewed as confident and competent and to always be adding value. And I know that I do. And I always have this kind of underlying, it's my kryptonite, is the fear of disappointing or not delivering value. When I work with people and one of my offerings, I guarantee that they're going to land two corporate contracts as the result of work with me. And I will work with them until they do. So I've got that guarantee. And I, I find I will always go the extra uh, mile with people. And I, I find it hard to, um, how do I say this? I find it hard to not worry about that. I think I do okay. So that's, that is my Achilles heel. One of the things that jumps out to me is I, I love how you actually are trying to, to channel it in, in a sense into doing something constructive with it. What you're talking about with this guarantee of yours, it's really you being willing to, again, put yourself, put really stand behind your work. It's like, this works and I'm confident enough in it that here's what I'm willing to promise. And um, I think when we can take our desire to serve people and just be careful about where we point it, we can put it into constructive places. I think if we start to think about feelings and drives and so many of these things, if we just think about them in a real general energetic sort of sense, it's like it's all forms of energy that if we can harness, blend with, redirect that energy, we can do really powerful things with it. As an example, one of the things I know for me I've learned is I have, I have to remind myself that like if I don't take time out for me to recharge, to recover, I'm not going to be able to serve people as well as I otherwise would. And so I have to be careful that in my desire to not disappoint people, I don't end up acting in a way that disappoints people. <laughs> so <laughs> I think some of it is just about really making sure we zoom out to 30,000 feet sometimes and see the big picture in the longer term. We've got to keep the big picture in mind and again, find ways to, to harness or, or redirect it, right? And really use it in how we approach our work. And in your case, that level of commitment to your work and to your clients. I think that's a really powerful guarantee. And I think that's really cool. And I love what you just said about taking time for yourself, really recharging so that you can provide that value is so important. I, I love that. I think that's fundamental. So Kim, you're at freedomstreetinc.com, right? And that's I-N-C as in incorporated, not I-N-K as in <laughs> the stuff that comes out of a pen. So yeah, so- <laughs> And then street, spell it out. So freedom, S-T-R-E-T-I-N-C, not pen, <laughs> dot com. <laughs> dot com. And I'll put, all, I'll put all that, I'll put a link to that in, in the show notes as well. But yeah, so you can go there to learn more about Kim. She's got a blog there with a lot of good information. And you can set up a call if you want to talk to her about uh, the work she's doing now. Absolutely. Get a complimentary strategy session and you can look at, uh, at, at look at your business. I'd be, it'd be a pleasure to, um, to connect. If you are ready to fight back against the man, Kim's the, the person to reach out to. Kim, I want to I want to say thank you so much for for taking the time to come and talk to me today. Really enjoyed the the conversation, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with Rainmaker and as you go forward on your journey. Thank you, Steve. This is a pleasure. That's it for this episode of the Sensitive Rebel Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. You'll find show notes, other episodes, and a whole lot more at sensitiverebel.com. We'll be back next week with another conversation. Until then, keep moving forward. Hey, it's Steve with a quick program note for you. There won't actually be a new episode of the Sensitive Rebel next week because we're taking a little summer vacation and we'll not be releasing any episodes during the month of August. The show will be back in September. I would love to hear from you about 
what you've been enjoying about the show, about things that you think maybe could be improved or changed about the show, any feedback that you have. So you can reach me at steve at sensitiverebel.com. I hope you enjoy the rest of your summer, and I will talk to you in September. Take care and keep moving forward.